and welcome to this episode of FPL Family X with me, Sam. And today I am joined by David, who's from FPL in the dugout. Hey, David, how are you? Hey, hey Sam, I'm doing really well. Thanks, and you? Yes, not too bad, thank you. So tell good, us good. all a little bit about FPL in the dugout. So ITD started about five years ago. This will be my fifth season. So 15, 16, I basically decided after chatting to my friends, I'm a big, big football fan, big sports fan. I'm going to give it a go. I really wanted to be a pundit as a kid. Um, most kids dream of being on match of the day to score the winning goal at their, like, their home team. Um, mine was sitting on the sofa and talking about the events of the day. So I wanted to be a pundit. I've also really wanted to be into um, sports journalism. So I thought, just give it a go. My friends are really supportive and they said, why not just give it a try, put your money where the mouth is and um, see if you have what it takes to be a half decent pundit. <laughs> Love so that. yeah 15 16 was the first season and it just started as a microsoft word document to five or six friends just sending that round via email on a weekly basis just a, a topic of conversation about what's going on in, in premier league or, or fantasy terms t- for strategy uh, and then from there after that season it went really well uh, and it went into a weekly wordpress blog sort of post every every week uh, and then from there it's turned into the instagram page so but yeah, it's, it's gone really well over the far, first sort of four years. Um, yeah, huge, huge, huge Chelsea fan and huge football fan. And um, as a football fan, I think that's why I really love FPL because you're talking about football on a weekly basis in terms of the strategies, the managers, the transfers. And um, you've got to take notice of every Premier League club. You can't just have a team at the moment filled with Manchester City and, and Liverpool <laughs> assets. So you've got to really pay attention and, and enjoy watching everything about about the Premier League so yeah that's where in the, in the dugouts come from as you say it's come from just one post a week sending to four or five friends and my mum and dad <laughs> um to, to the Instagram page now I love that I love that that it reminds me so much of, of FPL family back in the day when it was just like Lee and I sat on the sofa talking about fantasy football and then all so of a sudden cool. it was like 10 people would watch us on YouTube and it's grown so much <laughs> and it's amazing where it can take you yeah um, definitely Okay, so they can find you at FPL in the dugout, right? Over they on Instagram. Can indeed. That's right, yeah. Any plans to make the move to other social medias over the course of the season? I'm on Facebook, but everything that just goes on Instagram just travels over to Facebook. Um, I am Facebook. thinking of doing Twitter. Um, I literally had this chat yesterday with my wife, like, I think I need to get on Twitter. Um, so that might be coming soon. I'll look over that in the next week or so <laughs> to see how it all works. <laughs> yeah, don't talk to me about Twitter because that, as we all know, is Lee's domain. That's I am just job, Facebook yeah. and, and Instagram. Yeah. But yeah, it'd be nice to have you over in the Twitter community as well. I know that yeah, that one is, is a really good community. Perfect, but no, just Instagram at FPO in the dugout. Amazing. Right, so what we are going to do today then, we are going to talk about dream teams. So for us as FPL managers, the dream team at the end of the season is something that I know I look at quite carefully in terms of my planning for future seasons. But over the course of the season, obviously we get a dream team each week that tells us about that particular game week. How much attention do you pay to the dream teams that come in every week? I, th- I think it's quite important. I mean, especially when you're on the fence about certain transfers, the dream team doesn't have to be the full 100 million budget. So if you've got a, a nine or 10 million player that you're, you're not sure of, or, or a six million player you're not sure of, there could be someone in that bracket that performs really well that week. Um, and so when you look at the dream team, you're seeing who's on sort of short-term form. And if you're looking for like a, a short-term buzz or, or someone who's in that purple patch, I think the dream team is quite a good sort of tactic to look at. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think the dream team is really important for those, like you say, purple patches. It's the yeah. one that kind of flagged Antonio to me during Project Restart. Yeah. And I think for me, the dream team is something that I kind of cast my eye over and think I like to play a game of how many of these do I own this week? Exactly um, right. <laughs> and see whether I'm doing okay, because the more team, the more players you've got in your dream team, the better, obviously, you have done in that game week. Yeah. Um, and over the course of the season, it's nice to kind of look at the, the whole season and think, right, well, how far away from my team was this dream team that we've created? And I think it's quite valuable in terms of planning for the new season coming up. So we've obviously both had a look at last season's dream team. We've both we have, put together yes. a, who we think might be on the dream team for this season coming season yeah um so if we just have a quick look so last season's dream team contained obviously pope between the sticks who was just unbelievable oh. um this season did you own so him good. i did have pope yeah mm. did have pope yeah see did i never know no. i owned him for one game week in the final game week of the season where he didn't keep a clean sheet oh, no. like wow yeah pope, <laughs> pope was my kind of 
what if I suppose but then equally I did have um Henderson for most of the season he was my yeah, keeper see. for the majority and he did really well yeah exactly um, right so I can't moan too much but yeah Pope no, between the sticks <laughs> Henderson um, fine. yeah the back three was made up obviously of those three Liverpool defenders with Trent's Robertson and Van Dyke. I'm guessing you owned at least one of them. I did, yes. No, I had Trent and I had Van Dyke for the majority of the season and kind of flipped in between Robbo as well. Um, I had Gomez for a while just to budget and enable. Uh, mm. But no, I think Trent was a, a must have for last year. Oh, for sure. And I think probably, well, interesting to see who you've got in your dream yeah, team this I won- year. But... <laughs> I wonder who our first pick at the defence will be. <laughs> oh, I wonder. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, I only owned one Liverpool defender for the season. It was, um, it actually wasn't Trent at the beginning of the year. It was Robertson. And then I moved to Trent um, a bit further into the season. So he wasn't in my team the whole way through. Um, I think he came in in about game week three when I realised yeah. that I probably made a big mistake here. Um, <laughs> react, and early, I, react early. Yeah, and I kind of flip-flopped between double Liverpool defence, double Liverpool attack. I couldn't kind of make up my mind how I was doing it. But I think... This season, certainly, depending upon the fixtures when they come out, the, the double Liverpool defence does definitely look on, particularly as you probably can't budget for Salah and Mane alongside yeah. Aubameyang and KDB and Sterling and everyone else you might want through your midfield. Exactly right, exactly right. Yeah, so in terms of the um, dream team from last season, then the midfield was made up of uh, the legend that is Kevin De Bruyne, Salah and Mane, right. Sterling and then Martial. Any of them surprise you? So Martial really surprised me, actually, really surprised me that the fact he hasn't really found his full form and, and sort of ability at Manchester United. Um, and then all of a sudden makes the dream team since, since restart and, and sort of when Rashford was, was playing as well, Martial was on fire and, and was looking like the player he really, really could be. Um, but no, I was really surprised if you said at the beginning of the year, Martial would make the dream team, um, I, I would be probably disagree and saying I'm not sure Manchester United aren't looking I still don't know what I don't know at the beginning of the year if they knew what their strongest 11 was or where Martial was even playing but no. he did really well when he sort of moved up top and especially when you've got someone in midfield in that FPL bracket playing up top that that's a that's a game changer so that was a little bit of a surprise and it'd be interesting to see whether Martial's made your dream team for this season given that he is now forward in the game so definitely can't make our midfield uh, dream team for next season it'd be interesting to see where if you've placed him if, yes definitely. somewhere at all um, and then up top we have Vardy and Aubameyang um I was a little bit surprised actually not to see Danny Ings in the dream team for last season because he was so so good um over large chunks I mean there were a few windows of, of blanks for him but the majority of the season Danny Ings was consistently good was right up there with the golden boot yeah. and I guess if we'd have been able to have three attackers in that dream team we probably would have seen Danny Ings appear in there as well. But with yeah. just the two, Vardy and Aubameyang kind of makes sense for the way last season. Yeah, I think Mar- I think Martial just pick- pipped him in terms of points. So he sort of snuck him ahead of him. But he was great all season. Um, my wife plays FPL and she had Ings early on and was always sort of screaming about how she got him at 6 mil or 6.2. And how she was, was in my camp. Continu- <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Reliable Danny Ings. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I started the season with Shay Adams. Um, and it was uh, only on a, we, Lee and I went to St. Mary's last season to watch Liverpool um, quite early on. In fact, it was about a year ago-ish today. And um, at that point, I was like, why have I got Shay Adams? I need to have Danny Ings. And I think he cost me about six, 6.1. It, it wasn't a lot of money. Um, hence why, but then the trouble is, when you, when you get somebody in that early and they don't cost you much, yeah. you then can't get them out when they get off of that purple patch because it's going to exactly cost so much right. to bring them back in. So I yeah, probably exactly. held him for longer than I should. And I only took him out as um, during my unlimited transfers for Project Restart. And what a mistake mm. that was because he came back so well. Oh, he did. Don't talk about Project Restart. That's where it all went wrong for me last <laughs> oh, season. Oh, no. Yeah, it went, mm. just kept falling and falling and falling. It was, <sighs> uh, it was a bad end. <laughs> so when you get out of the routine of FPLing, I think that's the trouble. FPL yeah. is so much driven by consistency and the fact that it's game week after game week I often find that after an international break I'm a bit sluggish because I've, I've had a week away from from looking at it yeah okay so let's talk about our dream teams then so what David and I've done is we've put together who we think might make the dream team for the 2020-21 season now obviously dream teams there isn't any budget so we can have whoever we think is going to be the best performing players in Money each position. No option. Oh, it's nice, isn't it? If only the girl <laughs> was like that. Um, so let's start with the keeper then. So who do you think is going to be the best performing keeper for this season? 
I found this really, really difficult, um, the goalkeeper. So, so for me, a goalkeeper um, to even challenge for Dream King goalkeeper has to be um, keeping clean sheets, but also making the saves because Edison was nowhere near last year and he, he won the Golden Gloves. So I've actually gone a little bit left field with Cash Michael. Um, so he's had 13 clean sheets last season. So he was joint third, um, two penalty saves. And at the same number of saves, Dean Henderson last year with 97. So I think in terms of save potential, um, he's, got the, he's got the ability to, to rack in some points. Um, clean sheet wise, yes, Leicester are starting the season a little bit low, le- a little bit low on, on defensive assets, but um, that can inc- increase the um, save potential. Um, but as I say, 13 clean sheets last year, they could they'd look at building that. With, uh, they just got to keep DD fit. It could be, uh, it could be up there. I actually really like that as a pick. It is totally left field. I, I do agree with you. But I think for me, Leicester, I mean, Cashbush Michael is a great goalkeeper. Um, got penalty saves in his luck as well as we've seen um, during the 1920 season. So it could be a really good pick. I have gone probably with the most obvious of keeper picks for this season. And I think mm. potentially the only reason, well, the only reason I think he wasn't up there for the Golden Glove this season and the only reason he didn't make this season's dream team was because he didn't play for a large chunk of the season. And I'm going with Alisson at Liverpool. I knew that was coming. <laughs> I, just, I can't look past Liverpool um, no. in terms of their defence. And I and I do think that, you know, had we not had those weeks and weeks at the beginning of the season where, you know, Adrian played because Alisson got injured in that first game week, mm-hmm. we would have seen probably the total for Alisson be hugely higher than it was. And actually, we probably would have seen that total for Trent and Robbo and Van Dijk be hugely higher as well because the yeah. clean sheets would have stuck I think back to all of those times watching Liverpool with Lee last season when Ale- when Adrian was in goal and Alisson was injured um, and his frustration at the silly mistakes that were getting made left, right and centre. And so I can't look past him. And I think we'll see a return of Alisson um, properly over yeah. the course of the season. As long as he stays fit, I can see Stay him fit. being the dream team keeper for next season, which I think kindly, kindly gives us a nice transition into the defence because I yes. imagine we're going to see a lot of the red in this defence. I, I think... I think there might be a little bit of red in this defence. So <laughs> I've, I've, I've got a back three um, and, and two of them are, are red. Um, and we'll start with Trent. Do you want to just give us a, Tick. what do you think of Trent? <laughs> I mean, uh, what is there to say about Trent? I think if he's not in the dream team for next season, then he's probably had a large layoff during this season because I can't yeah. see any other reason that no. he doesn't leave the dream team for next season. But who's your other Liverpool then? Who did you pick? I've actually gone with Robertson over Van Dijk. So he was the second highest point scoring defender behind Trent. And he was three points higher than BVD last year. And he played 300 minutes less. Um, mm. So I think his attacking threat is, is incredible, just like Trent on the other side for Liverpool. Um, and he's just a fan, fantastic left back. Um, to, to, both defensively, especially when you've got Alisson and, and Van Dijk sort of holding the fort as well, just gives Robertson that time to just run forward and try and get some points at the other end for us and the FPL team. So, yeah, I've gone with Robertson. And interestingly, I've gone with Van Dyke because like I I found I find myself looking at Robertson and Van Dyke, and I was like, there's definitely going to be another Liverpool defender in here, mm. but I'm not quite sure which one it's going to be. And the minutes thing was a big factor in my decision to go with Van Dyke because, having yeah. said what I've just said about Allison and the clean sheet potential being hugely greater with Allison between the six over Adrian, with Van Dyke pretty much guaranteed to start every single game the clean sheet should roll in pretty much every single week. And I think if we get a consistent run of of, um, clean sheets early on in the season, we could see Van Dijk outscore Robbo, not on the basis of attacking returns. Obviously, Van Dijk has headers in his locker and all of that. But um, in terms of the number of clean sheets, because Robbo will probably miss out some games here and there because that's what Klopp, you know, he's not not Pep. But he, he does like no, he's to. Not pep. He does not like to. <laughs> he does like to rest them occasionally if there's other big games coming up. And um, particularly, Klopp doesn't give me as much of a headache as Pep does. No, that is absolutely the truth. And <laughs> while we're talking about managers, just to shout out to our other FPL X video with FPL Raptor, they talked a lot in, in that video about Klopp. So if you haven't watched that, find it on the channel and give that one a watch. Yeah, go check it out. Who's your other defender then? Because I'm imagining you've gone. Th- Three five two or three four three. So. I've actually gone three four three. Yeah. So my mm. other defender, um, again going back to the beginning where I was saying that you don't want a team full of Liverpool and the City. Well, at the moment it's just Liverpool and the City with, wow. with Cashman Schmeichel. But um, I've got Laporte. Um, so I think Laporte is absolutely vital in, in City's push to to try and win back the Premier League title. 
And I think he's the starter at the back. I think he's Pep's most reliable defender. 15 appearances last year with eight clean sheets. Um, City pass out the back, so he's heavily involved in the, in the passing. So his BPS score will, will rise and, and get on the bonus points. And one goal in 15 appearances as well. So I think he's got potential at both ends of the field, especially if City needs to tighten up. Um, even though last year they got the most <laughs> clean sheets. But I think even with Laporte at the back, that will give City even more rigidity. So I've, I've gone with Laporte. That's really interesting because I actually overlooked the Man City defence entirely when I was looking <laughs> at these. Leave on, them. on the basis that I was kind of a bit like, you never really know what you're going to get with City. You sometimes that get brilliance and you sometimes don't. And I think you're right in what you just said. It's about consistency of the, of the picks and if they can get a good defence working, and obviously they have Ake now, who I think is a great acquisition yep. um, for Man City. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see how they put together that defence mm-hmm. um, and whether they can kind of work together a bit better and, and keep cut those mistakes out of their games because they do have, have the tendency to kind of focus so much on going forward that they sometimes do. that has a negative impact on their defence. Um, I've actually gone with somebody that, in my view, is, is FPL royalty as my third um, defender and I've got the lovely Matt Doherty in my dream team defence and Great in shot. part that's because Wolves don't have any European football this year mm-hmm. so last season um, we saw a very difficult start for Wolves on the basis that they were playing in the Europa League they just didn't have the squad size or the squad depth to rotate nicely around Europe and around and the Premier League, and then, of course, the Cup when that comes into play. So what we saw from Wolves is very sluggish start to the Premier League last season where they just never really got going. No. Um, and as a result of that, I think we didn't necessarily see the best out of their assets. Even Jimenez, I don't think necessarily we saw the best of Jimenez last season. We saw some great things, but not the very best until uh. they settled. And it was probably sort of November-ish time we started to see them play better across the competition so for me Matt Doherty is one of those players a bit like Trent who um, always has the potential upside of attacking returns he is pretty much now to start every week like I said about Van Dijk when I mentioned him Um, and Wolves are a good defensive unit they have a great goalkeeper behind them they have a really nice, consistent back four, um, and that really helps in terms of keeping clean sheets. So I think Matt Doherty, with the potential for clean sheets from Wolves, um, alongside his attacking returns, plus Wolves' desire to get back into Europe for the 21-22 season, because they were incredibly unlucky to miss out on a Europa League spot for this season. In fact, at one point, I thought they were going to push for the Champions League spot. And then they obviously were pushing for that through the Europa League and unfortunately went out. So I think Wolves could be really lovely picks for this season. Yeah, me too. Obviously for the Dream Team, I think it's Doherty. For your FPL teams, it's very difficult because the budget is what it is. It's hard the to pick Doherty. Unreal this year. That, have you, have so you started tough. a draft yet? Obviously this is going out a little bit later, but have you started yet or are you waiting for the fixtures? I had a little tinker. Had a little tinker, but it's it's been... It's, it's difficult, I think. I think my tinkering's been mostly done in my trusted notebook as to players that I would yeah. like. And then I'm looking at the rest of the budget thinking, my goodness, there's got to be some really good um, third striker options. Yeah. And at the moment, I'm kind of praying that Brewster gets a, a loan oh, yeah. deal. That would be nice. Fingers because, crossed. <laughs> yeah, let's see where we are. Now, I think the midfield is much more difficult this year. And as FPL managers, the midfield is just a minefield. There are so many players in there. For me, I could name like eight, probably even nine off the top of my head that I would like to own for this coming FPL season. So picking ones for my current team and picking the ones that I think are going to perform the best proves a bit of a challenge. It's a bit of a conundrum. But who have you got? Who are your five? Um, Again, I've, or I've, four? I've, I've found this really t- tricky as well because you say when you're looking at your team, there could be eight, nine, ten that, that could go into your team. But Absolutely. trying to pick four or five for, for Dream Team I found was quite hard. But the first name I'm going to go with is a Bamiyang. So now he's reclassified as a midfielder. Arteta's just going to build the team around him. I mean, 22 goals last year. Um, he'll get an extra point for scoring from the midfield point. Um, he's on penalties. I think that's that's an incredible gift that FPL has given us, <laughs> making a Bamiyang a midfielder. Um, that, that I just think that's one to sort of cash in on. Yeah, I think his involvement at at Arsenal is, is massive in terms of his uh, percentage of involvement, whether it's assists or goals, but 22 goals from a midfielder. If he can do that again this year, um, yeah, I think he'll, he'll walk straight into the dream team. 
funnily enough, he was the first name in my midfield as well. I think it's okay. it's hard. And from an FPL point of view, he's actually the one that I haven't put in any draft that I've done so mm. far because it's so difficult to work him in alongside all the other big names. But I think at the moment, Lacazette is still an Arsenal player and we haven't heard any kind of news yet as to whether he's still going to be an Arsenal player come the close of the transfer window. But if Lacazette leaves, I think that makes Aubameyang even better of an yeah. FPL option. So, yeah, he was first on my name. Um, on my team sheet for the Dream Team 2, closely followed by the absolute Egyptian king, that is Mo Salah. Do you have him in there as well? A hundred percent. You I, you can't look past Mo Salah. You, you can't. He's, he's electric. Even when, when he joined the Premier League, that first season was, was absolute fire. Um, 19 goals and 10 assists last year. I mean, lip, lip, he's, and he's a midfielder as well. He plays more. <laughs> he's just, just like Aubameyang. He plays so far at the pitch. Um, Firmino drops and, and helps sort of um, Mane, which we might get onto a little bit, um, and Salah go further forward. Uh, and so, yeah, Egyptian King Salah is, is in my FPL dream team as well. So, interestingly, did you put Mane in your dream team for this I season? I have got Mane as well, yeah. Wow. Okay, so you've got both the Liverpool boys in I there. Um, and then who makes up? Because I think you said you've got four, right, across the midfield. So, Aubameyang, Salah and Mane. Yeah. And who's the KDB. other? KDB. Mm. KDB, I think he is, for, for me, the best Premier, Premier League player. Um, he, he's, he's phenomenal. I mean, we're looking through now. As a Chelsea fan, I'm thinking KDB's in the dream <laughs> team, Salah's in the dream team. Where could Chelsea have been like a couple of years ago? Um, but no, free kicks, he's likely to be on penalties again. Um, K, KDB, I mean, I said Aubameyang was first on my list and then closely by Salah, but then it was closely KDB. So yeah, um, yeah De Bruyne for City, um, he accelerate City forward um, he's at the heart of absolutely everything they do which is um, so great to watch and yeah I think he could be up there for biggest point scorer again for this year how about yourself is, is did KDB make the cut for you obvious yeah so KDB was my pick um my kind of differential pick at the beginning of game week one last yeah, year too. so he was in my in my first draft in fact he was in every draft that I did pre-season last season only on the basis that I couldn't afford Sterling <laughs> so I, I, I kind of and I think back to myself this time last year or myself a little bit earlier because obviously we, the season was going by this time last year um, kind of and the worry that I had about having KDB and not having Sterling and, and was it going to be okay to cover the City attack mm -hmm. with just KDB um, and my goodness it wasn't just okay it was actually the best FPL decision or pretty much the best FPL decision that I made last season was to own 100%. that guy the whole way through. Um, so this season, he, he clearly made it. So I, I've got Aubameyang and Salah, as we've already mentioned, KDB, and I've also put Sterling in there as well. I nice. think yeah. Man City look like um, a wounded beast to me at the moment. They look like a team that are thoroughly fed up of how this season's panned out, you know, losing the league in the way that they did um, with the points gap that there was there. Um, and then going out of the Champions League a few weeks later, it's. Uh, I think it, it's a very. It's been a very hard season to be a City fan, and they've been really unlucky. There's been some key injuries to to big players, particularly thinking about Aguero. Um, but they need to be better, and they have the players to be so much better this season. And I think this season could be a much tighter race. Although don't tell Lee that I said that because he'll be very <laughs> we'll upset keep that with me. Quiet. Yeah, keep that <laughs> bit a bit quiet, but. Yeah, so I, I think KDB and Sterling, for me, both make the dream team for this season. They're both, the minutes are going to be consistent. Of, yeah. of all of the Manchester City players, I expect that they will be rotated the least mm -hmm. um, in the pep chaos that is the roulette um, over is there. The absolute pep roulette headache that it's every hard. FPL manager will, will suffer from most of the season. Absolutely. Um, and then I've got a five-man midfield because I couldn't look past Bruno Fernandes. Yeah. And I think, you know, we look, we look at Manchester United prior to Bruno arriving there and they were just not, they were not at the races. They had a very bad start to the season. Oli, there was all that talk about, you know, should Oli be the manager of Manchester United? And then all of a sudden Bruno arrives and it's like a rejuvenated um, United team that we start to see. And then obviously with the return of Pogba, um, the return from injury of, of key kind of other players as well. So we've suddenly got a, a Manchester United team, which on paper looks brilliant. And I, and I think Bruno is, is at the heart of that. And for me, he's in there because whilst, you know, you could arguably say that Pogba is their talisman. For me, it's Bruno. He's on penalties. Well, he's going to be probably sharing them with Rashford, yeah. but he's on penalties. 
it's hard to pick between him and Rashford and Greenwood from a FPL manager perspective in terms of that midfield. But I think with a budget-free dream team, he is the one that's making that Manchester United team tick. He is the one yeah. that's going forward. He is the one that's going to be on most of the penalties or at least half of the penalties. So for me, yeah, Fernandez absolutely made, made it into my dream team, which leaves me only with two spots two for strikers. my forwards. Yeah, yeah but go on, start with yours. So who was your first forward? Well, just going back to the Fernandez pick, I think it's a really good pick, but the only reason I didn't pick him was just looking at the, the sheer attacking threat Manchester United have now. Um, I think Fernandez is, is brilliant because he's, he's going to be on penalties. But as, as you rightly said, you've got Rashford, you've got Martial, Greenwood, Pogba. Um, you could have a week where they score four or five goals and, and one of those guys isn't involved in them. So I, was, I found it really stressful. Man. Do I pick Fernandez? Do I go Rashford? Does a Manchester United player go into it? Because it could be um, they take it in turns to, to sort of bucket loads of points each week. Yeah. But, uh, no, I think that's a really good pick. Really good pick. So did you put your Chelsea new boy? In your th- in your front three, I did, I did, <laughs> I did. You know, I'm so excited for Werner. I'm so so excited. And as I say, with with ITD, I try and do the whole punditry with no rose tinted spectacles. So hard, and, uh, and it, it is really really difficult. But when when Chelsea make a signing like Werner, um, to me, that wow. I mean, wow, this this could be um, a superb sign for Chelsea. Obviously linked for Liverpool last year and, and everyone was raving about then. 34 Bundesliga appearances, 28 goals and 8 assists. Um, it is a different beast. It is a beast and a half, the Premier League, coming from the Bundesliga. Um, so it is a risk. And as, as we go back to say, who was a surprise last year? Martial was a surprise to be in the... Um, the dream team. I also thought Pope was a little bit of a surprise as well. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't expect sort of a mid-table um, to sort of mid-table to the low mid-table um, yeah. get sort of up there as the main keeper. So I thought there's going to have to be some sort of risks and, and roll the dice on a couple of players and why not have a shout out for Timo Werner. So no, with the creativity as well in that midfield for Chelsea, um, Ziyech, Mount, Pulisic, uh, we've got Abraham still, we've got, obviously if the, if the players are two. Um, I'm so excited for, for Chelsea up top. Not so much Chelsea at the back. I'm <laughs> dreading um, defensive Chelsea assets this year. I'm glad to see Rudiger and the likes being at five million this year, which makes them attractive. But um, yeah, we might have to score sort of three or four. And, yeah. and if, if, if Werner's leading the line with the creativity behind him, that could be um, that, that could be exciting. I must admit, I had exactly the same thoughts and put him in my dream team as well. I think it's it's not often that you get. So I think with Chelsea this year, I mean, I owned Abraham for a large part of the seasons, but during Project Restart and actually just before it was Giroud who was leading yeah. the line and, and playing incredibly well. And as, as you know, you know, and, and all the guys that watch us know, my, my family are, are divided down the middle and I, I have two very hardcore Chelsea fans in my dad and my brother who are very, very excited about the arrival of this guy. And I think he's exactly what Chelsea needed. And like you say, can play up top alongside Abraham. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Abraham isn't, um, a good FPL option no. moving forward um, but I think this guy and he's nicely priced as well in terms of the game like really, you can fit really him in really priced yeah as you've said it does worry me a little bit in terms of the change from the Bundesliga up to the Premier League that is mm-hmm. a little bit of a concern however um, at that price he's easily movable to somebody else if he doesn't kind of kick on but I think by the end of the season once he's settled in he'll be in the dream team um, because also there isn't huge amount of, of other options in terms of the big hitters up top with the strikers this season because a lot of them have made the move into midfield exactly right exactly which means right. that my other forward oh i wonder if we could guess who's made the dream team in my final spot hmm. Hmm. of course it's my <laughs> beloved <laughs> so i've got harry kane in there as is, my as my final pick for the dream team this year again injury last season meant that he just didn't have the season that he could or should have done but we saw when he came back from injury that he was back um, to his Harry Kane best eventually once he got back to full fitness and I think actually the fact that he's not playing in August and the fact that <laughs> we <laughs> and the fact that we have a um, we have a, a Spurs team who are now a bit more consistent in terms of who uh, the manager's a bit more settled we've got a bit more of a consistency in terms of the the structure of the team and there's a bit more like the midfield is a bit more set and I think Hoijberg will really help Kane because he's that kind of defensive midfielder which we needed so it'll stop Kane dropping back which should mean that he's always in the right positions talisman 
on penalties, everything that you would love as an FPL it's manager. In every box. Every absolutely, box. absolutely. So yeah, I'm holding Kane as my kind of as my final pick for my dream team. But I'm guessing you probably haven't done the same. I 100% have done the same. I have! 100%. I completely (laughs) agree with you. I mean, 18 goals last year, 29 appearances. It'll be the first full season under Mourinho. Yes. Um, And and so he's had time with them. The team's developing. Um, Touching on your point of Hoiberg, I think he's a great sign-in to solidify that midfield. Say, I live three miles from St. Mary's, so I've been to a couple of games and and see Hoiberg is is a good player in the centre of that. Um, Mourinho loves a striker and we, we saw that at Chelsea with, with how much responsibility Drogba had and I think if Kane sort of picks up from that and, and carries on from last year and say back to fitness again no, no August <laughs> <It's always laughs> uh, we, we could see a massive goal involvement and say um, going back to the reason I didn't go with Fernandez is the goal involvement at Manchester United is, is so fluid um, yeah. with, with Tottenham it is Harry Kane is the guy. Um, yeah. So no, Kane makes Kane makes it as slot number two out of three for my front line. So go on, finish us off then. Who's your final player? Again, another risk. Um, I was thinking with with Sterling, um, but I've actually gone with Aguero. I have actually gone wow. with Aguero, um, which is very bold. I know that's very bold um, and maybe a little bit crazy with uh, with rotation options with Jesus. Um, 24 appearances, 16 goals. Uh, at, but in terms of appearances, he only played 16 matches worth of minutes. He is so explosive. And, yeah. I, and I think if he remains fit, he will pick up on, on KDB and, and going forward. It's just going to be electric for, for City. Um, Mendy's back, so he has so much threat going forward on that left-hand side, which might make Sterling a little bit more central or maybe yeah. even make Sterling a little bit more redundant moving backwards. Um, but yeah, I have gone with Aguero. I mean, he's, he's so overlooked in, in fantasy football um, just because of the pet roulette headache. But you know what? Dream team, Aguero goes in for me. He's my favourite striker in the, in the league. Um, I think he is the best striker in the league. Um, so if he, if he keeps playing and remains <laughs> fit and, and Pep just doesn't sort of play with our minds every week, uh, uh, he, he, could, he could make it. So that's your full dream team. That's my full dream team. How many of these players are going to make your first draft? How many can you squeeze in? That's the problem. It's squeezing them in. I mean, there's a lot of premium players there. Um, yeah. Obviously, if you look further back, you can obviously probably squeeze Cashbush Michael in at 5 mil um, yeah. if you wanted to go that high because I'm probably looking at a 4.5 million goalkeeper just to try and get 0.5 extra in that midfield. So sure. I think comfortably you could look at maybe five. I think if you're looking to um, sacrifice a little bit, you could get six. I mean, it's looking at the, the balance. So um, Mane and Oriol Romeo, if you're starting Oriol Romeo just to get Mane, um, the points combined might not be as good as Pulisic and Greenwood, for example. So yeah. that's where you've got to sort of balance out whether or not that one more premium pick's worth two sort of um, very good picks. Um, so yeah, I'm going with five so far. How about yourself? What, what, are, you, what are you feeling? So I'm on five, but there might be six. Um, yeah. It just depends on how I feel about Fernandez against the other Manchester United assets, because obviously yeah. Fernandez is that little bit more money. So I could drop mm-hmm. it down to Rashford. I could drop it down again to Greenwood. Yeah. Um, or just go without a Manchester United midfielder altogether and, and have um, Martial instead. That's another option that I'm kind of looking at. So mm-hmm. depending upon my position with Fernandez, I'm probably looking at five as well. I'd love to have a team of all of these. I wonder if I can get onto FPL and ask them to extend my budget. So just ask for have- a little extra. I yeah, can have all great. of these but yeah I think um I think it's probably going to be five I think there's so many that I would like but for me one of my key strategies with FPL is always to kind of try and find some differentials early on the likes of Danny Ings from last season mm-hmm. build that team value so that then I can bring in some more of these once the season is in full swing and they're really performing so that I don't miss out on kind of that yeah that budget stuff as well so yeah all right so that's our dream teams for this season that's how many we would like to have in our FPL teams fingers crossed it will go well so just remind everyone David where they can find you if they would like to have some more FPL content from you over the course of the rest of this season sure so if you want to check me out I'm at at FPL in the dugout uh, either on Instagram Um, I'd stay tuned for that um, because I've got to learn Twitter first so yeah if you (laughs) want to check me out um, weekly posts you can see how my team is Um, I'm going to post out there to to see if you want to join uh, my mini league uh, and, and yeah, let's just have some fun. Amazing. All right, David, thank you ever so much for joining us on this FPL Family X. No, and thank I will you catch you over on, I'll catch you over on Instagram over the course of the rest of the season Perfect. and I'm sure we'll catch up. 
at the end of the season, if not before, to see how far see how we're getting on. Yeah, see how many of these players made the actual dream team. Bring it on. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs>